some folks today and so in the interest of time I'm certainly going to jump into our scripture we are <clears throat> finishing up our consecration and I you know have been thinking a little bit about how to uh, invite us all to stay particularly grounded in the the spirit of what we've all been leaning into for the past Mm, 21 days or so, uh, often people engage in these spiritual practices, whether they're fast, whether there are uh, situations of spiritual uh, disciplines, and uh, we're so excited when they're over, and then we feel like, man, now I can go back to my regularly scheduled life. But I do believe that there is a very powerful, powerful sensibility around divine interruptions that God brings into our lives so we will not go back to how life used to be. Some interruptions are planned, some interruptions are unplanned, and yet they always provide us an opportunity to never go back to how it used to be. The pandemic was such an interruption. I don't know if I would call it a divine interruption, but I certainly uh, can say that it has forced us all to reimagine a new way of life. 9-11 uh, was an interruption. Many of us who are old enough remember the world before 9-11, when you can walk through an airport and not have to go through any kind of uh, checks. You can literally wait at the gate for your loved ones to get off the plane. Amen. You didn't have to wait at the baggage claim or, or, or be harassed by a, a, a police officer while you're waiting on the curb to pick folk up. Somebody say amen, right? Uh, the crack cocaine epidemic uh, interruption. Some of us remember what it was like before crack descended into our communities. I don't know if any of us go back before slavery and before the, 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 the indigenous genocide of this land, amen, but I want you to know that there are always interruptions. Some are massively scaled and some are personally impacting, but can you imagine that God is inviting us to commit to never going back to a way of life that is beneath God's original intent. And that is what I hope we gather from this passage. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, we went over this passage a little bit with our leaders yesterday. And, 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 and as I was preparing for the leadership meeting, uh, this passage came into my spirit, and, and it just wouldn't leave even after we left. And so we're going to spend a few moments here inviting us to think a little bit about how we won't go back to a former or a inferior way of life. Scripture, verse number one, Isaiah chapter 58. This passage is uh, likely written during the time in which the children of Israel uh, were literally experiencing exile. They were experiencing a way of life under the bondage of their a perpetual enemy, an enemy, an empire called Babylon. And they were trying to figure out why God had abandoned them, why God had left them to the whim of their enemies. And so uh, they began to engage in their own spiritual disciplines of fasting and consecration. And things did not change the way they thought they would. And so the prophet is speaking to the people, helping them to get language and understanding about uh, why the world was not changing in the way they had thought, and perhaps what kind of life should a consecration catalyze in the life of we who are attempting to follow the way of God. And so this is the backdrop a people in exile, a people engaging in the practices of spiritual renewal, and the reality that life is not changing. I don't know if anybody can resonate with that, right? Because how many know that many of us, we have been shaped to have a transactional relationship with God? It's like, God, if I give you this, if I do this, then I'm going to automatically get this in return. 
But the reality is, is that God is not uh, a hustler. Mm -hmm. You can't bargain with God. Amen. Sometimes you just got to do what is asked of us and appreciate, as we'll talk about in the sermon, that the reward is in the obedience. Isaiah 58, shout it aloud, the prophet is saying, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. The prophet says, for day after day, they seek me out, speaking on behalf of God, and they seem eager to know my ways. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. They say, why have we fasted and you have not seen it? They ask, why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? God responds, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? a day that is acceptable to the Lord. So, so the prophet is, is kind of playing telephone cop with the people of Israel, right? They're upset that their lives are continuously hard and difficult and drowning in un- injustice and struggle. And the prophet is relaying to them that, Just because you call or participate in the ritual of a fast, it does not have any magic powers to unlock any doors. Verse 6, God says, is not this the kind of fast that I've chosen? Is it a fast that looses the chains of injustice and unties the cords of the yoke? to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own family, your own flesh and blood. Well, some of y'all like, Pastor, you don't know my family though, see. Well, God's asking you some questions today. Verse number eight, then your light will break forth like the dawn. Your healing will quickly appear. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Verse nine, then you will call and the Lord will answer and you will cry for help and God will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always and will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins, will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairers of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. 
All right, lots of, lots of, lots of uh, conversation, holy conversation happening with God and the people. And uh, I pray that the word of the Lord uh, is planted in our hearts. I'm going to speak from the topic today, uh, holy continuity. Holy continuity. Bow your heads and let's pray. God, we thank you for the words of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide these words in our heart. So we will not sin against you, and please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Come on, come on. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I got to keep it holy today. I got to keep it holy. I got to keep it holy. got to keep it holy. Now, uh, we talked about a couple Sundays ago, or maybe it was last Sunday, that to be holy is not about perfection. It is not about you necessarily uh, never making a mistake. To be holy from a biblical point of view is really about being set apart for the particular uses of God. Uh, To be holy, particularly in the biblical text, was God's uh, instructions to a people to make sure that The things that are being used for sacred purposes are not defamed by being used in everyday life. That's why they built a temple and a tabernacle, not because people did not did not gather outside the context of the temple or the tabernacle, but the temple, the tabernacle was the place where if we gathered here, we knew God would meet us. They had priests and they had uh, singers and 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 it, they even used animals to sacrifice. Not because there was something special about the human beings, something special about the sacrifice, but it was about the purposes being uh, 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 particularly set apart, so it would not be defamed by being used for everyday things. I want you to understand, beloved, that, you know, we're in a new year, obviously, and we're almost out of the first month, and, and you know, everybody always comes to a new year with a new uh, revelation, a new sense of, of, of purpose. Uh, we all have these, these, these ideas and these aspirations. Some people call them resolutions, and we're, 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 we're making a commitment that I will not have the same kind of year I had in 2023. And so we go through all of this kind of hand wringing and, and vision boarding. And, and even in church, we, we, we tell the Lord, Lord, I promise I'm not going to, Lord, if you just thank you for bringing me through that last year, I'm not going back. Anybody told the Lord that already yet this year? I'm not going back. Amen, right? And I don't want you to go back. <laughs> Praise God. Yes, move forward. But part of what I believe is so important for us to fully acknowledge and appreciate that there are practices that require our engagement to build a new set of habits, holy habits, if you will, habits that ensure that you do not get caught up in things that cause you to be defamed, cause you to lose your value, cause you to not be treated as one who is sacred, cause you to make sure that I'm not going to allow everybody to handle this, handle my body, handle my mind, handle my spirit, handle my talent, handle my my contributions, that I'm going to be someone who is acknowledging that what God has given to me is holy. And if it's holy, I need to engage in practices that maintain my sense of holiness, my sense of being set apart. We're engaging in a practice today called baptism. It is a sacrament within the church, which just means that it is a practice that has a particular divine intersection, if you will. In the church, there are several sacraments that 
over time have been acknowledged. Every time we take communion of the Eucharist, that is a sacrament. We believe that the ordinary, the, the bread and the wine, literally are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some in our uh, Catholic kind of spaces call it transubstantiation, that the, the, the bread and the wine, actually, the bread and the wine actually become the body and the blood. And, and it, was, it was such a, a bedrock belief that in the early church, uh, people that did not understand what they were talking about, they called the early church folks cannibalists. Because they would be celebrating. No, oh, we eating <laughs> Jesus' body. And folks who were uninitiated in church for the first time, were like, Where did I, what did I walk into? I thought I was coming to the cemetery to have a prayer meeting and y'all out here eating dead bodies? Man, it's something that kind of rubbed people the wrong way. Sacraments, these ideas that God's spirit can literally inhabit ordinariness and turn it into a supernatural encounter. When we get in the water today, and the souls are baptized. Yes, it is an outward expression of an inward transformation, but it is also an extraordinary <laughs> a extraordinary expression that the spirit troubles the water. And it enacts a miraculous change. In the old church, we sing a song that says, a wonderful change has come over me. It says, I looked at my hands, and they look new. I looked at my feet, and they did too. Change my mind, change my heart, change my soul, that to follow Jesus ought to enact an extraordinary change. And so my question for so many of us then is how can we engage in a consecration, an action that is intended to continue to cause our consciousness to be catalyzed and elevated, that we are engaging in holy actions and yet, all the way through the consecration, we participate in unholy things. Now, you know, of course, whenever you're in church and you start talking about holy and unholy, everybody goes to the vices that they don't struggle with, or maybe you do, and they feel all guilty about it. But in the text, you don't notice the text talking about your personal piety alone. It certainly talks about our ability to have healthy, wholesome, mutual relationships. For at the end of the day, I do believe that is what politics should be about. It should be about the way we structure society so every human being is treated holy. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Like, you are treated as a sacred Gift from the Most High. After all, it is the Most High who created us. And yet, we can participate in practices that are at their core intended to bring us into a more faithful posture before God. And yet, all the way through the practices, as the, as the, the, the audience in the, in the text uh, are being accused of, continue to literally engage in unholy practice. It makes me think about the complicity of the church and how we are often so religious in our actions, but yes, not Christ-like in our behaviors. And it again, it is not because I'm expecting you and me and us uh, to be holy, a.k.a. perfect, but it is for us to be conscious that, God, I know I need to be able to be open to how you are calling me to be more faithful. 
And so in this passage, the writer says to them, there are a lot of things that you guys are doing during this fast. And you're wondering why <laughs> nothing's changing. Wouldn't it be something to start doing a practice and nothing else in your life changes? Oh, I'm fasting, but I'm still fighting. Oh, I'm fasting, but I'm still cheating. Oh, I'm fasting, but I'm still stealing. Oh, I'm fasting, but I'm still an oppressor. Oh, I'm fasting, but I'm still a warmongerer. Oh, I'm fasting, but I'm still taking advantage of the, the vulnerable around me. And then you have the nerve to come ask God, so God, while I'm fasting, why is nothing changing? <laughs> Seems like the one thing missing among many in the fast is self-awareness. <laughs> that perhaps our practices must also compel us to engage in a certain kind of behavioral shift. And so when I talk about holy continuity, I know the fast is, you know, we're going to wind the fast down sometime today. Some of us are going to end right after service and go run down the street and get a hamburger because your body's just craving <laughs> some meat. Somebody say amen. Some of you are going to wait till midnight because you sanctified. Amen. <laughs> Some of y'all going to wait till the morning because you just tongue-talking, demon-slaying, walking on water kind of follower of Jesus. I'm not going to tell you when I'm going to end. I'm just going to let you. <laughs> gonna let your imagination run wild. But once you stop fasting, I hope that your holy continuity is sustained. I hope that we think about what must we do in order as we fall back into some dietary practices that the actual ethical lives we live remain holy. And so from this text, I, I got 10 things that the scripture says that you and I probably should Keep doing <laughs> if we're going to have holy continuity. If you fast, if you get baptized, if you take communion, if you engage in any of the sacraments, if you're just a follower of Jesus, this text gives us a whole laundry list of things we ought to keep doing. It's going to give you 10. I'm not going to, you know... Uh, uh, you know, be too long-winded on all 10 of them because then I got another 10 things I want you to think about. All right, so I'm, I'm going to be a short-winded black preacher today. <laughs> sort of kind, amen. <laughs> 10 things the scripture says that you ought to ensure you do to maintain holy continuity. First, don't be self-righteous. Stop oppressing your workers and ease the burden of those who work for you. Stop fighting and quarreling. Don't rely on symbols over substance. Free the imprisoned in jail. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Those are six things. Got full motto. Seven, share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the unhoused. Give clothes to the naked. And help your relatives and family members in need. Now, these are the things that God through the prophet is challenging the children of Israel to do while they fast. And I want to offer to you, maybe we didn't get all 10 of them going during the fast, but if we want to maintain holy continuity, 
Perhaps you ought to write these down, put them on your, you know. How many of you ever do the, the word a day? Put it on your little mirror. Or you got your, uh, your, your, your quote for a day. Maybe you should write these 10 things down and put it on your wall. And ask yourself, how can I maintain holy continuity in 2024? Because coming to church, I'm glad y'all here. Believe me, because, you know, we've been missing y'all. We've been praying for some of y'all. But you coming on a Sunday once a week is not holy continuity. There must be some practices that are aligned with the spiritual disciplines that we've just engaged in. I want to invite you to think what kind of lifestyle must I adopt where I can be so sensitive to how I treat people that I will not be an agent in someone else's oppression and be silent about it. Now, all of us and many of us are complicit. We see the great example of that right now in the way our military is, is playing all across the world, whether it's in Israel-Palestine, whether it's in Ukraine, uh, the ways in which we are, are staying out of tragedies that we ought to perhaps weigh in on since we seem to like to be the police of the world. Somebody say amen, right? I remember some of our members here several years ago at the beginning of the pandemic came to me and let me know about a genocide happening in Tigray. That Ethiopia and, and, and uh, 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 a small community within Tigray were literally being uh, wiped out of the country and pushed across the Sudanese border. And I remember calling our Congress people and calling everybody new at the White House, and I couldn't get anybody to weigh in on that. I was thinking to myself, man, this is harder than I thought. But I realize that sometimes we intervene and sometimes we don't. And that is a part of complicity. When you have the power to do good and do not do it. It breaks our holy continuity. Now be mindful, it's very difficult to take on every problem in the world. Someone told me, Pastor Mike, you are a rebel with a cause. You got you. I mean, you. Every cause, you just rebelling. You just like, there ain't a cause you ain't like to rebel. I was like, that's because I'm waiting on you. <laughs> I'm glad to hand off this cause to you. Pick a cause. Somebody saying, give your neighbor high five. Tell her, pick one, just one. <laughs> I didn't ask you to just solve everything, but these ten things. Can you imagine what it would be like if you weren't self righteous? Because I'm trying to maintain my holy continuity. Can you imagine what it was like if you were not oppressing your workers or the people who work for you? So I was like, oh, I, you know, black people can't be an oppressor. Have you met a boss who is African-American, Asian, Latino? A, you know? First time they got some power and they don't know how to act. Tell your neighbor, I know that's not you, though, praise God. I know. <laughs> How can you maintain your holy continuity and not be someone out here fighting? Striking people with your fists. How do you not rely on symbols over substance? How many know there's a lot of uh, performative activities happening in the name of justice and spirituality and Christianity and intellectualism and a lot of performative symbolic efforts, but when you Go down to the substance of the thing. It is light. It is fluffy like cotton candy. Holy continuity. And so my question for some of us today is, what behaviors must you continue to achieve as a life set apart for God's special purposes in the world? How must you shift some of your behaviors and practices to maintain holy Continuity. Now, I do believe that if obedience is the reward, beloved, then there are things that should emerge from your and our obedience, our efforts, not as a transaction, but as a natural growth. How many of you know that if you eat 
too much sugar, it will accumulate pounds. The devil didn't give you them pounds. Somebody say amen. It wasn't the devil, wasn't no conspiracy from the enemy that just added a whole bunch. Of, it, was, it was sugar. My, my, my trainer told me that I had to stop drinking so many sugary drinks. I said, what? <laughs> then he showed me the, the, the label on the drink and cranberry. I, I like cranberry grape. I, it's better than soda. That's what I said. It's better than soda. <laughs> Do I get the brother get any credit? 47 grams of sugar. I said, the devil is in my cran grape drink. <laughs> just, just, just possessed it, amen. Just no amount of exorcism. I guess you could buy the diet version. And then it goes down to maybe six or something. But the more I drank it, it was good. I realized that it was very difficult for me to drop needed pounds. So my lungs damaged from COVID can have better freedom to breathe without restriction. Somebody say amen. Amen. Wasn't because of the devil, it was because there was some sugar. And it was a natural outgrowth. The less sugary drinks I drank, the easier pounds fell off my body. Well, I want to say the more continuity of holy living, the natural outgrowth will be some of these things. Salvation will rise like the light of the dawn. How many of you know that science teaches us that there is a certain rhythm of life? And it is not work for the sun to dawn every day. It just happens in the rhythm of life. The more I engage in holy living, Salvation rises in my life, in our lives, like the light of the dawn. Wounds in your life quickly heal. You will be led by godly decision-making and discernment. The more I engage in holy living, I learn how to make better choices. Just as a natural outgrowth. The glory of the Lord will protect you. On the rear guard, which means that you will be less susceptible to sneak attacks because you'll have perhaps some protection. Perhaps you may even have some spidey sense. All you who grew up watching Spider Man could sense that something was getting ready to happen. the more continuity of holy living you have. You can literally be more protected. Because why? Your senses aren't burdened down and cluttered by all the lack of continuity. Anybody ever caught somebody in a lie? I was going to ask a different way, but I know y'all wouldn't be honest at church on a Sunday in the presence of the Lord. Where you told a lie, and you couldn't keep up with your lie, and you continued to get tripped up in your lie, and it became so burdensome that you just finally broke down and just told the truth. (laughs) Hello, somebody. How many know when your life is not consistent, you get tripped up in your deception? And you can't have continuity if you are drowning in deception. So holy living, a life set apart for God's purposes means that I'm going to major in the truth. And I got to remind you that God rarely gives us all the truth at the same time. 
because you can't handle all the truth. But most of you can't even handle a little bit of the truth. So God give you a little bit of truth in doses. Just a little dose till you, till you can conquer that truth. That's why you should never be content in the place where you're in. Because you don't have all the truth. You got a dose of it. And you're struggling to embrace that. It's a dose of truth that you're a piece of work. Mm -hmm. That, that, that you, you have some malice in your heart towards certain people. That if push come to shove, you will take them out before you. Hello, somebody. A dose of truth. God wants you to not find yourself so caught in deception that you can't make wise decisions. Several more, you, you will, you will, you will uh, 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 have light rising in dark places. My prayer for some of us is that we will be the light. Gloom will become like midday. Anybody ever been in a gloomy situation? In this era, I will call that depression. Emotional distress. Mental anguish. That following the ways of God should expose us to our gloom becoming like midday. We're going to talk about mental health in a couple months. And I do believe that every follower of Jesus needs to surrender themselves to some regular mental health services. I'm just telling you, life's too hard for you just to be out here trying to figure it out. You go get your teeth worked on. You go get your body checked out. You go get your hair did. Get it lined up. You do all this regularly. Why not take care of your mind? Oh, I can't afford it. Guess what? Here at The Way, we got 10 free therapy sessions a month for members of The Way. Man, it's like, I guess I got to lose that excuse. <laughs> We've had that for going on six, seven, eight years because we believe that we must take care of our mind in order to have continuity. The Lord will continually guide you. You will be satisfied in scorched places. You will have strength to your bones. You will be like a watered garden and a spring of water whose waters don't fail. These are things that you can expect to happen. Just like the sun comes up without your effort, when you live a holy, con con a holy life that has continuity, you can expect these things in the course of your life. So I I've given you 10 things that I want to invite you to think about. God, how can I lean into these 10 things as our 21-day consecration ends? And how can I, as I lean in, expect and look for these 10 things to emerge? And then how can I show up in the world? I got this mojo, thank you. How can I show up in the world as the rebuilder of ancient ruins? How many know some of us are living amidst the rubble of ruin and we're being asked to rebuild some things? A razor of old foundation. Some of us are the keepers of intergenerational wisdom. When it says to raise up old foundations, it means that some truths, if you don't keep them alive, will be buried under the weight of contemporary thinking. Scholarship, wisdom, intellect, studying. You're helping to raise up old foundations, things that are hidden. When you build a building, you just don't plop a building on the ground, you got to dig deep. You got to find a solid foundation. Why? So when the world, when the, when the elements begin to shake, 
The building does not fall. I appreciate many of us who have given ourselves to the old foundations. Scholarship, wisdom, thinking, the griots, those who don't cause us to forget that we're on a lonely land. Why should we not forget that? So we don't go to somebody else's land and take it and forget that, Lord, have mercy. I'm an imperialist just like the people I'm fighting. Repairer of the breach. What relational bridges need repairing? The breaches, the walls. How I many of there are gaps in some of our relationships, some of our communities, some of our lives, and God is calling us to stand in the gap? Finally, restorer of the streets. This is my favorite one, just because I like the way it's worded. Of course, we do a lot of work in the streets. But can you imagine what it would be like if we were committed to restoring the streets? <laughs> the neighborhoods in which we lived. That we just didn't want to keep our house safe. We wanted to keep the streets safe. We wanted to keep neighborhoods and cities and we were a catalyst for that. All of this is what I want to invite us to think about as we move from the 21-day fast, 21-day consecration. Is there space in our lives for holy continuity? Amen. Not just go, oh, I'm glad we're done. Man, I'm done with the Daniel fast. Now I can go back to the way life was before. I mean, do what you must, but is there a continuity that you can maintain? I told the leaders yesterday that uh, when I was at UC Davis and I was trying to be there as an engineering major, they didn't want to go to class. I flunked out, just so you know. That, that don't work, so don't try that. <laughs> My mentor, he was uh, assigned to me by, I think it was called Nesby's, the National Society of Black Engineers. And they gave you mentors, brother, real cool brother, you know. That was a little cornball, because you know, I thought I was cool, you know. So I was like, oh, give me this cornball. I'm, you know, I'm trying to have fun. But when I got on academic probation after my first quarter, he sat me down and said, hey, Mike, you know, um, you have to go to class. I was like, ah, I know. I said, well, you're in a pretty bad situation right now. So why don't you go to study hall? Get caught up. And then he told me this, I'll never forget it. It takes nine, this is what he told me, it takes 19 days of consecutive behavior to develop a new habit. Said the neural, the, the, the neural pathways in your brain literally dig out new ways of existing if you just do something 19 days in a row. Said if you go to study hall for 19 days straight, you will find it less difficult to go. Then, you know, I was 17, 18, away from home for the first time. Don't get no ideas, praise God. And I never forgot that some of us have engaged in these days of consecration. Maybe we went the whole 21 days. Maybe we didn't. But we can, through the power of God's spirit, create new habits to maintain holy continuity. I'm giving you a whole bunch of them. Maybe you want to make your own list based off of what the text and the scriptures and our traditions teach us. But I don't want us to end our consecration and just go back to the way we used to be. There's better for you on the other side of these 21 days. There's better for you in 2024. There's better for us as God's people and certainly in our communities and in our country if we engage in holy continuity. So that's my challenge to us today. As we stand, as you grab the hand of someone next to you, if you don't mind grabbing their hand, if you want.
want to just touch the shoulder or the elbow just so we can have a little point of connection. It's okay to do it across the aisle. That's okay. That's okay. We, 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 we making a connection all across the building. I like that song. It says, a wonderful change, a wonderful change has come over me. Has come over me. A wonderful change, a wonderful change has come over me. God, I'm praying for the hands I'm touching today. God, you know that healing and life and strength and hope and joy and peace, all of these are requests that we carry regularly. And I pray that as I'm touching my beloved today, my neighbor, the one you've gifted me to spend this sacred time today, I pray that you will bless every request they have. Maybe this is their first time hanging out with us today. I pray, God, that they would be convinced that there is a way that seems right unto us, but the end is destruction. But there is a way of life that you've invited us into, a way where we depend on the power of your spirit to help us embrace salvation as it is presented to us to acknowledge that we can have healthy whole relationships interpersonally communally politically globally god we need not be consistently bogged down by the impulses and the threats of war and death and violence and abuse and harm and God, some of us are asking for a new life today, God, a new start, a fresh start. These days of consecration have clarified some things for us. And so I pray, God, that the person I'm touching will make decisions that outlast this consecration. That their 24 will be better than their 23. Not just because they had more fun, but because now they're on purpose. They're moving, God, in divine alignment. God, that they now know and they now see that if I just follow your ways, just as the sun comes up every day, so shall salvation. Just like the light shines every day, so shall my dark places be illuminated. Just like, oh God, uh, my, 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 my years uh, uh, turn so I'm becoming older. Lord God, so will the wisdom that I've accrued begin to accumulate and through the power of your spirit Lord better is coming and better is here to stay lift your hands right where you stand so now God it's me oh Lord and I stand in the need of prayer it is not my mother it is not my father it is not my sister or my brother but it's me oh Lord and I need you I need your love I need your power I need your strength I need your anointing bless me God heal me somebody say heal me Lord Save me, somebody say, save me, Lord. Deliver me, somebody say, deliver me, Lord. And may I have holy continuity so I can be a light, be salt in the earth, be a follower of you so I may be your representative in every space I'm in. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them, keep it holy, keep it holy, keep it holy, keep it holy, keep it holy. Keep it holy.